Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliet Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Welcome back. Have you ever wondered who keeps the academics in check? Or maybe an even better question is, did you even know that, unfortunately, journalists, scholars, and professors had to be kept in check sometimes? Today, on October 24th, 2022, I'm excited to welcome the guy that Nick Gillespie calls, quote, the intellectual watchdog, Phil Magnus. He's a scholar at the American Institute for Economic Research, AIER, I got that right. Um, And the author of several books, including Cracks in the Ivory Tower, The Moral Mess of Higher Education, and The 1619 Project, A Critique. He corrects scholars across the political spectrum. So watch out. Don't get things wrong. Um, Today, I want to talk about his efforts to correct the record on claims made by Duke professor Nancy McLean against one of the founders of public choice economics, Nobel Prize winner James Buchanan. We'll get into that. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So before we get into that whole mess, um, what is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? Well, I'd say people that are are, are currently going through college and university programs uh, generally arrive with the assumption that their professors, that the faculty that they encounter are uh, credentialed experts in their fields and generally know what they're talking about and can be relied upon to be uh, at least factually accurate when they present material in front of the classes. And uh, while I don't want to denigrate the expertise of people that have studied uh, many, many years to build a um, uh, basically a PhD dissertation and a research repertoire around it, uh, you see a lot of claims coming out of the academy that are put forth on the authority of uh, supposed expertise, but turn out to be uh, based on political ideology or just really bad understandings of the subject areas. I guess another way of saying this is that uh, I would urge everyone um, in your cohort and your age to be uh, uh, skeptical and epistemically uh, humble about the way that they approach uh, what they're seeing and hearing in the classroom. And that fits right into what we're going to be talking about. So let's get into it. I'm going to tell you how I discovered your work. Um, All right. I'm currently taking a public choice class at the University of Virginia. Um, Very important to public choice, UVA is. Um, I'm kind of proud of that, even though I didn't do anything. I just happened to go here. Um, So at the beginning of the semester, I was talking to a peer of mine who happens to be the president of the econ club. So this guy is like an econ fanatic. Um, oh, yeah. And he told me that James Buchanan was a racist and that I should read Nancy McLean's book. I was really surprised because I'd only heard good things about James Buchanan. And of course, it came from economists. But here's this like econ guy who loves econ. He's the president of the freaking club. Right. And he's like, yeah, this guy is such a racist. And I'm like, what? So I Google the book and then I find thousands upon thousands upon thousands of words written by economists from different universities that are denouncing mistakes, misleading statements and deceptions throughout the entire book. But no one wrote more than you did. Only (laughs) maybe Mike Munger and Don Boudreau. But you were definitely like at the top. Uh, So before we dig into the dispute specifically, can you tell us what public choice economics is and sorry, who James Buchanan is and why his work is so important? Yeah. So public choice economics is basically an application of the tools of economic analysis to public sector decision making. Uh, And this includes... uh, basically at its foundation, it used to be referred to as non-market decision-making. So uh, how resources are allocated by government and governmental entities is a big part of it. Um, It's how uh, we analyze what comes out of the policy sphere in major ways, uh, using tools of uh, trade-off, scarcity, incentive structures, uh, everything that we would apply in uh, in private sector transactions. Uh, it's asking the question, what happens if we look at the public sphere using the same tools? And we find out it's actually not a very pretty uh, way of um, understanding the world, but it is a very realistic one. 
Uh, Buchanan himself used to call this the study of politics without romance. So uh, uh, we often encounter like the Civics 101 high school education version of American government where uh, uh, everything works perfectly in a, uh, a constitutional system. It's how the bill becomes a law. Administrators seamlessly implement uh, what they're directed to do by Congress and so forth. Uh, public choice theory really challenges that by saying, wait a minute, these are human beings, uh, human beings that are uh, rational actors in the same sense of uh, just about any one of us. And in that circumstance, uh, human beings respond to incentives in ways that are often uh, misaligned with uh, the supposed profession of serving the public, uh, fulfilling the public good. So. Buchanan wrote a lot about majorities and like this kind Absolutely. of plays into what what the book touches on. So what were his warnings about majorities? Yeah. So Buchanan is a uh, he's a trained public finance economist that's interested in how certain acts of legislation become law, how uh, constitutions operate. And uh, really, that gets into some of the fundamental questions of how interest groups interact under a constitutional framework, which we know from political theory, this is a question as old as politics itself. It's something that's discussed in Plato and Aristotle. Uh, and in a more recent sense, it's at the core of uh, things like the Federalist Papers. Madisonian constitutional theory is about uh, the contest of interest groups operating under a system of rules and frameworks that have various majoritarian principles in them. So Buchanan jumps in is basically a theorist in the same vein uh, using economic analysis, but he's really concerned about the questions of uh, where does a, a majority level fit into a constitutional system relative to the laws that are passed. Uh, so one of the big questions he asks, and he points this out uh, very clearly, that a simple majority of 50% plus one does not always give you the most socially ideal uh, outcomes. Uh, that can actually be a very... Uh, bad situation if it's a very narrow majority and that uh, 50 percent plus one is using the power it attains to that majority to uh, penalize the other 49.999 whatever percent uh, that are in the minority. Uh, so he's deeply concerned about both uh, majoritarian fairness, but also the rights of major uh, minorities that uh, could potentially be abused by uh, the public actions of a very powerful government that's entrusted uh, in democratic means with a, uh, a certain form of government. So he studies constitutional design and asks the question, uh, what types of rules will get us to uh, better socially acceptable outcomes that respect the rights of both the majority and the minority, uh, that, it, that minimize the costs that the majority can impose on the minority, but are also uh, seeking to yield effectual decisions in the public sphere. And one of the tools he comes up with uh, in studying this uh, basically gives a rationale on why in some decisions we have super majorities. Uh, why in other decisions we require unanimity, uh, the idea behind unanimity being that if uh, you have to have 100 percent consensus on a vote, uh, the represented interest of every party is encompassed in that. Uh, so he's asking the questions of how these different voting and constitutional rules yield certain outcomes and also asking why when we see bad outcomes that come from the systems of government we see in the real world, uh, that may be a misaligned uh, position in relation to a voting rule. So the guy seems like he's just such a fascinating dude. Um, so I, to me, it seems it seems like it would be difficult to like smear this guy because he's yeah. just such an yeah. economist. Like what, you know, um, but how do you think McLean would describe her book, particularly the claims about Buchanan and what claims did she make? Yeah. Well, I'll preface this by saying that McLean's book is basically a conspiracy theory writ large. Uh, she has decided that uh, nefarious entities uh, funded by dark money, mainly the Koch brothers is the, the, the main target, although she expands into some other areas, have derailed the American government and uh, given us uh, policy outcomes that are built around what she calls market fundamentalism. So it's all these buzzwords that you see on the political left. Uh, but basically what it comes down to is she's trying to come up with a theory that explains why left-wing progressivism, especially in the economic sphere, is not the dominant policy regime of the United States 
uh, and certainly at the times that she wants it to be. So she thinks that the country should be much more progressive than it actually is. And she thinks her policy outcomes should be built around uh, some pretty heavily far left economic redistribution, heavy regulation, heavy involvement of the government and the economy. And she's convinced herself that these are naturally popular democratic outcomes and therefore anything that uh, leads to, say, lower taxes or deregulation or that blocks attempts to redistribute uh, massive amounts of wealth is uh, at odds with democracy itself. So she looks at Buchanan's works and she thinks that she's found the theorist that has given like this uh, complex blueprint uh, for uh, nefarious right wing dark money forces to step in and uh, distort and pervert the purposes of American government away from uh, uh, progressivism and toward enriching the wealthy few and enriching the corporations. So it's a, it's really at its base level a uh, kind of a vulgarized left-wing conspiracy theory, and that's the core of her grievance. And then Buchanan becomes the bogeyman. Uh, he becomes the person that uh, she can assign all of this blame to, and she claims that she basically uncovered the secrets of the conspiracy, and her book is presented as a way to tell those secrets. This, this just occurred to me for the first time, but Buchanan came after the founding. Yes. So the, the rules existed before him. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he's basically mainly an interpreter of those rules. If you read his main work, The Calculus of Consent, uh, there is an implicit underlying Madisonian constitutional democracy at work that he's dealing with and he's trying to interpret. And it's one of his major inspirations. So what evidence does McLean provide for all of these claims? (laughs) Well, Her claim to fame and the way she presented herself in this book is right after Buchanan died, um, she obtained access to his papers at George Mason University. And this was a period of maybe about six months before his papers were boxed up and taken over to uh, the GMU library for proper cataloging and archiving. Uh, Somehow or another, she applied for and got access to those papers, which during Buchanan's own lifetime, other scholars did from time to time that were studying his work. But she was the one that uh, claims that she got in there uh, to really expose the secrets that uh, uh, were being hidden in this house at George Mason University where the papers were stored. And she got in there uh, basically with her thesis already written. Uh, I know this because I've seen the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities grant that she used to fund this level of research. She had her entire story written out in that grant application uh, before she arrived at the archives. And then when she got there, she just cherry picked uh, pieces of letters that she thought she could spin into confirming this conspiracy theory she already showed up with on the day she arrived and basically wrote a book working backward from that point. Uh, One of the things I did discover in in some of my uh, critiques and analysis of the book is the only reason she discovered Buchanan himself as a place to search uh, was because of a mistaken footnote in another work that had identified Buchanan as uh, having written this article in the late 1950s that uh, the mistaken author uh, claimed appeared in the Richmond News Leader, which was the main segregationist paper in town. Uh, and it turned out to be a citation error. And McLean said, this is where I found Buchanan and discovered that he was in league with the segregationists. Well, it turns out the citation error, this uh, other work she cited, had listed the wrong newspaper and misidentified where this op-ed Buchanan had written uh, even appeared. Uh, so she stumbled onto him by a mistake of another author and never really deviated from or corrected that mistake in her own research because she had her story and it was ready to go. And what it comes down to is she claims that Buchanan, he showed up at the University of Virginia, was hired there in uh, 1956, uh, which happened to coincide with uh, some major events in the civil rights movement, particularly in Virginia. So she claims that Buchanan showed up there and inspired by basically segregationism, racism, and deeply uh, conservative Southern outlooks on the world, uh, set about trying to find a way to preserve Um, a racial plutocracy in Virginia without calling it outright segregationism. And that's the thesis of her, uh, at least the early chapters of her book. So uh, I just want to jump to the implications, but let's talk about what's problematic with her work. Um, Mm -hmm. There are a few different problems. 
The first being that she's not an economist, which is not in itself a problem, but that means that, you know, you should, if you're writing about economics, you should actually know economics to a certain degree. You should maybe ask economists for feedback because it's not your area of expertise and, you know, it doesn't hurt to check, but she didn't do that. Um, can you give us some examples of those sorts of claims that she makes where you can tell she doesn't understand economics and can you correct them for us? Absolutely. Yeah. So you see, you see this, uh, these are the minor errors I call in the book is uh, just reading it. Anyone who's versed in um, economic language and major figures in the profession uh, could detect them. So for example, at one point she, uh, she misidentifies where uh, Ronald Coase does his, uh, his studies. Uh, another Nobel Prize winner that was briefly at UVA uh, during the same time Buchanan was there. Wow, in other wow. cases, yeah. So, so, so in other cases, she uh, misinterprets basic economic terminology. So uh, uh, and, uh, economists are somewhat at fault on this. When they uh, economists adopt the term like public goods, they're referring to a very specific, narrow definition of that concept. Uh, whereas McLean may read something like that and uh, assume that it uh, it entails well, what is in the good interest of the public. Uh, so there, there's basic errors like that of uh, misinterpretation. Uh, she does this with terms like scarcity uh, as well. So it's, it's someone who's just very uh, outside of the economics profession, uh, not even understanding economics 101 style undergraduate courses, uh, who's attempting to interpret economic uh, terminology. And what it means is every time she encounters something that uh, she doesn't know, uh, she interprets it in the least charitable light and uh, with a perspective that defaults to just progressive ideological priors. She also made a lot of misleading claims, not fraudulent claims, but misleading can you give us some examples of those and correct them as well? Yeah. So the first one, and this is what really got my attention in the book uh, when it first came out and was making kind of a splash. I started reading it, and she opens the, the, uh, the, the first chapter by basically declaring James Buchanan essentially took his theories – from what she calls his, quote, intellectual lodestar, and that is the uh, the Southern slave-holding politician, John C. Calhoun. So I'm reading this and kind of scratching my head because I, I've done a lot of work in Buchanan's uh, books and papers, and I had never once even seen him cite John C. Calhoun. Uh, so I started asking the question, where is she even getting this from? Uh, and it comes through a bunch of misinterpretations of some later authors that she ascribes and then projects back onto Buchanan. Uh, in the same chapter, she also asserts that Buchanan took uh, deep uh, influences out of a group of poets at Vanderbilt University in the 1930s uh, called the Southern Agrarians. And uh, her evidence for this was that Buchanan lived in a small town near Nashville where the Southern Agrarians were, uh, were based and uh, must have uh, picked it up from the uh, basically the, the the vibe in the air, the zeitgeist of the moment, and she asserts that these are a major inspiration for why Buchanan uses the term Leviathan in his description in certain models of the state and government action. Uh, so I'm reading this, and it's completely at odds with anything and everything that I've ever encountered in Buchanan's work. I've never seen him cite Calhoun uh, at that point, and I had. Uh, known very directly that Buchanan got the Leviathan concept not out of this obscure group of reactionary poets, but from the much more famous use by Thomas Hobbes, uh, the political philosopher, who Buchanan does in fact engage pretty extensively, uh, especially in his later works. Uh, so this struck me as just completely at odds with reality. I do some digging in it, and on the Calhoun point, I found an exchange that occurred from Buchanan's co-author Gordon Tullock in the uh, – uh, American Political Science Association's main journal uh, in the 1970s, where another author had written a piece about Buchanan and Tullock's book, The Calculus of Consent, in the American Political Science Review, and, and pointed out that there may be some similarities to Calhoun. And Tullock writes a response to this, and he says, I've never even read Calhoun and have no desire to, and nor has my co-author, Jim Buchanan. So this is just a basic error of fact. McLean has made in setting up the, uh, the, the thesis of her work. And of course, Calhoun's very useful to her for a uh, rhetorical purpose because she can draw a link between Calhoun in the 1840s and 1850s 
and segregationists in the 1950s and claim that Buchanan is carrying on their legacy. Oh, yes. It sounds really uh, academic and honest. Um, (laughs) So can you tell us about the, uh, maybe the worst, the made-up claims, the distortions, and the fake quotes? Yeah, yeah. So it even begins in the preface to the book, she imagines a fake conversation between Buchanan and the University of Virginia president, Colgate Darden at the time, uh, she writes out an imaginary dialogue and it gives no indication that this is uh, is a complete fabrication of hers. Uh, But it's an imaginary dialogue of Buchanan and Darden kind of conspiring in a back room to figure ways to salvage the segregationist order after Brown versus Board has been handed down and declared segregation as unconstitutional. Uh, But it's a completely fabricated conversation. There's no evidence anything even remotely like it ever occurred. And yet she's running with it. Why? I don't want to assume that she does that with malintent, but if you're making up an entire conversation, it's a little hard to say that it's not intentional. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I think she's so convinced of her own conspiracy theory, and I very particularly call it that because it is strung together almost Alex Jones style interpretations of history of the past. Um, This is a much broader problem with the history profession right now, and particularly historians that claim to uh, to study what they call the political right in the 20th century. And what they'll do is they'll go to archives and they'll scour uh, routine correspondence, uh, routine observations from people on the political right who they've deemed enemies uh, of saying, well, maybe this is the argument we should use against the New Deal and it's a priori assumed to be evil, uh, a priori assumed to be wrong, and therefore we must find the nefarious interest that is really causing this, the true story behind it. Uh, well, McLean has essentially done that with Buchanan because she cannot even countenance a world in which uh, he is making an honest, good faith attempt to interpret constitutional government. She seems to uh, be convinced that he is simply up to no good. Uh, he's simply up to uh, to propping up uh, the bad guys, the segregationists or the plutocrats or the wealthy people that she dislikes for political reasons. So everything has to be interpreted through that lens. And the fact that he's writing in the 1950s means that the civil rights movement is her default point of reference that she goes to. And she has to simply place him on the wrong side of the civil rights movement. Now, one of the issues here is she is dishonest in a sense, and she uses and uh, misuses documents and records and letters that she found in Buchanan's papers. She's a, a, a common practitioner of quote mining, where uh, she'll, she'll quote like half of the sentence and then intentionally admit omit the second half of the sentence that completely changes its context and meaning in ways that go against her thesis. But she's not a particularly competent historian either in the sense that she missed major clues. So uh, one that I I pointed out in several of my works on this is she opens her book by singing the praises of this uh, group of private citizens at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia. So after Brown versus Board came, was handed down, uh, the Charlottesville segregationists on the school board basically shut their public school system as a way to circumvent Brown versus Board. And there was a, uh, a group of anti-segregation parents in Charlottesville uh, who said, we aren't going to stand for this. Uh, so what they did is they set up uh, classrooms in the basements of uh, private houses. And a lot of them were university professors that volunteered their classrooms and said, well, uh, the segregationists are shutting down our our school system, uh, but we need our kids to at minimum be educated. It's a national news story that these uh, private classrooms are being set up. And McLean opens her book announcing these parents are the heroes of her whole story and presents them as completely oppositional to uh, what Buchanan was supposedly all about. Uh, the problem is she did not even know or realize that Buchanan's colleague and co-author, uh, Warren Nutter at the University of Virginia, was one of these parents that had little children that were excluded from the school. And not only is Nutter uh, involved in creating this group that she turns into the heroes, supposedly opposed to Buchanan, uh, Nutter is actually uh, one of the, the the major leaders of this. So uh, all the national news networks in 1957 come to Charlottesville, Virginia to see what's happening as this uh, pushback against segregation. And they go to Nutter's house 
and film a classroom in his basement. So she was not even aware of this, that uh, Buchanan's close colleague and co-author, the person she's painted as a segregationist, is actually on the other side of the issue. Jeez, it's just so bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it oh, brings man. her basic competence into question. And um, I don't use that lightly. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I want to laugh, but it's so, it's so bad for academia and just like, writing in general and ideas like ideas have consequences um, Absolutely. so before we get into that i really just want to jump to that but first her work wasn't peer-reviewed no. and your work your responses to her work were peer-reviewed so absolutely what what is a peer review what significance does it have and why didn't she get her work peer-reviewed yeah well, the, uh, the basic premise behind peer review is that if you're working on an intellectual project that involves high levels of expertise in a subject matter, before it goes into print, it should be put before the eyes of other people that are established and well-known experts in that same subject area. Uh, so they can review it and, A, detecting it, uh, detect errors that you make, uh, B, maybe offer suggestions from their own works of ways that you can improve your argument. Uh, so it's a vetting process that academia has developed over centuries uh, to try and improve the quality of, the, of anything that it publishes in a, a book or a journal. Uh, now, this is a process that's flawed. It's not a, a, a perfect process, but at least in an ideal world, it means that if I write an article about James Buchanan, it will be sent out by the journal editor to two or three different experts in James Buchanan, preferably from multiple perspectives, uh, where they can offer scrutinizing feedback to tell me if there are holes in my argument, if I've missed something. Uh, what I've gotten right, they can vet that to the editor. And then eventually, uh, through the multi-year publication process of uh, checking and critiquing and scrutinizing each other's works, you get a finished product that is uh, empirically and factually rigorous and robust. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's a vetting mechanism of sorts, but a mechanism that's intended to improve the quality of the work. What Should it McClain be a red did, flag? Totally sidestep that. It does should it take? Be. It should be. Does it take a really long time for something to get peer reviewed? Could it be for expediency? So it generally is a slow process. It's often multiple months at the bare minimum, and in books, it's often a, a multi year process. But uh, what we know in McLean's case is a she's a uh, a well published historian, so she knows what peer review is. She's gone through it dozens of times before, presumably. Uh, and B, even getting a book out on a trade press, it at least has uh, uh, similar lags in publication uh, to get to the point that it's a finished product. Uh, so her decision to sidestep peer review is very much intentional. Uh, I actually critiqued her on this, called her out a bit on it, and said, wait a minute, why did you go to a, uh, a trade press? And her answer, confirming the conspiracy theory that uh, underlies the entire work is, well, she didn't want to tip off people that were in Buchanan's camp that she had uh, that she was on to them, that she had figured out the, the conspiracy at work. And if it had been peer reviewed, where it had been sent out to other public choice economists who could have critiqued it, they would have known her great discovery and could have told the Koch brothers or something that she was on to them and disrupted her story. And they would have put all their money into blocking her publication. Absolutely. Well, uh, right after it came out, when I published my first review of it. Uh, this would have been summer of 2017. At the time, I was a very junior level, non-tenure track economics professor. Uh, had had a, a good job and enjoyed it, but uh, was very much not a senior member of the profession. And she posted this unhinged rant on her social media pages where she claimed that the Koch brothers had hired me to do a hatchet job on her book. And put out a call basically to uh, uh, to all her friends to uh, respond to me and bombard the press with claims that I was paid off by the Koch brothers uh, to, to take down her book. So it's uh, w w when I say this is Alex Jones style conspiracy theorizing, I'm not exaggerating in the slightest. Uh, she had convinced herself of this with absolutely no evidence other than the fact that I came out of George Mason University, which to her is the Koch mothership. 
Yeah, UVA is no better. We public choice was born here. It's yeah. that's what that's what the econ club president was telling me. He was like, "Of course we have a public choice class here." And I was like, "What do you mean? I like the class." Right. right. Like, do you not like the class? You can drop it if you want. Yeah. Um, but you know, I I believe that may, maybe she's changed. Maybe she's seen the error in her ways. Has she ever uh, admitted any error? None at all. Not at all. Not even the corrections to things that are like unambiguous typos or false claims, not even the made up conversations or the quote mining that she's engaged in. I found no contrition whatsoever from her of we're talking probably hundreds of of factual errors, unambiguous factual errors in the book. So now kind of broadening this, she is an extreme example, but there are other examples. You've you've done a lot of work in um, uncovering this sort of stuff. How common is it? What does it say about academia? Is it more common than before? What changed, if yeah. so? Well, I think it is an endemic problem across not only just the humanities and social sciences, you see it in the hard sciences. Um, a few years back, there was a, a very famous article published by uh, John Ioannidis, who's a uh, medical professor at Stanford, and he basically estimated that something like in the neighborhood of 90 to 95 percent of all research findings in the the physical sciences, the medical sciences, uh, are plagued by problems of replication. They cannot be uh, uh, recreated through objective scientific means. And some of that is much more severe than other examples of it, but uh, it, it seems to be that there's a sloppiness in general at minimum that is pervasive in a lot of the, the knowledge production. So this is why I, I warn your listeners at the very beginning to, to take a skeptical, scrutinizing eye to things that are claimed from authority by your faculty members, by professors. Uh, quite a bit of what's out there in publication is just not uh, nearly as rigorous or robust as it pretends to be. Uh, But I do think the problem is getting much worse recently, and this comes from the politicization of the faculty. Uh, We know through clear empirical evidence in surveys of faculty members that uh, ideological uh, leanings of professors have shifted very aggressively to the political left in the past 15 to 20 years. And I'm not even saying that as uh, as someone... I do come from outside of the political left, but I'm not saying that uh, the university has to have an exact balance of left and right and everything in between. Uh, Quite the contrary. What I am saying, though, is that when there's an ideological monolith in the academy, it creates an echo chamber effect in certain disciplines and certain departments. Because if everyone already agrees with each other on the exact same issues and they're all on uh, on the same page of their interpretations of both the past and present, there is very little basis or reason to even ask questions uh, when someone presents a theory that is uh, maybe not the most robust or accurate uh, in terms of its factual claims. Uh, so, for example, McLean was able to put out a book like this in the history profession because probably almost nobody else in her department would even have the wherewithal or the interest in challenging her interpretation of James Buchanan. Uh, so we see this in other areas of the academy. I've uh, I've tangled with uh, other history professors that have attempted similar style conspiratorial hatchet jobs on Ludwig von Mises. Uh, I've engaged in uh, a very deep data replication contest with uh, uh, Thomas Piketty and uh, some of the inequality economists that are are, are working on empirical claims of uh, supposedly soaring inequality and claims that the rich are not paying their fair share in taxes. Uh, so I've scrutinized their work and redone their calculations and compared it to other data and had uh, quite a bit of success in finding uh, clear problems in it that was just never scrutinized because they happen to tap into a politically favorable and fashionable claim of the moment when they publish their work. It's been a few years since Nancy McLean's book came out. Um, have you set the record straight with this and with other um, experiences like this? Have you been able to set the record straight? To the extent that I am offering a uh, well-sourced, well-documented, archivally deep, uh, counter narrative uh, that tries to get at a more accurate picture of what Buchanan was up to. Uh, I do believe I have set the record straight. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier, 
my work, I, I generally submit it before peer review. Uh, so my main article on this went through the Southern Economic Journal, uh, which is a well-regarded general interest economics journal. It went through multiple rounds and layers of peer review, was scrutinized by actual experts in the subject, everything that Nancy McLean did not do. Uh, now, the caveat on that is that even though I think I have uh, gotten the upper hand uh, on the evidence basis, uh, large swaths of the history profession still throw honorifics at her over this book. Uh, they still cite her work, including unambiguously false claims in that book as if they were true. So, for example, she has this whole chapter on how uh, Buchanan supposedly colluded with the Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet. Uh, in the 1970s and was supposedly responsible for entrenching a uh, plutocratic constitution in Chile. And it turns out some other uh, scholars have, who have uh, dug into the Spanish language archives down in, in Chile have found uh, the exact opposite is true, that uh, Buchanan isn't even known to them when some of the clauses she attributes to him were written. So it's an unambiguous factual error, and yet it's still cited as an authoritative claim from historians that uh, A, don't know any better, and B, have no interest in actually doing the research to discover anything better because it confirms their ideological position. You're obviously doing the most in this sense, and you are setting the record straight, but it seems, so if historians are still citing her, is that something that can ever really be fixed, or is that just, is that just it? You know, They're just going to... This is something that I think time will eventually fix. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I cannot imagine 100 years from now... A, an honest scholar looking back and reading this debate and concluding, oh, well, Nancy McLean was right. Uh, or looking back at uh, Thomas Piketty's um, empirical claims and saying, oh, this guy was right. Uh, so I see myself in many respects as leaving a historical record for maybe a less ideologically divisive time for honest scholars to come along and find. And I think if they work through the evidence as I lay it out uh, and compare that to the claims that are made on the other side, uh, but I do think my work ends up enduring as uh, the more robust analysis. Uh, but they're also going to look at the time and say, well, well, like, how did this person's thesis ever become such a mainstay in the history profession? Uh, and I look to the past myself for other examples of this. Uh, so for I'll give you another example. So in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, eugenic theory was a dominant uh, position in large swaths of both the social sciences and the biological sciences. Uh, we now that know that this is pseudoscientific nonsense. We know that a lot of the claims and studies that were published in that era uh, were in fact biased by uh, both racist positions taken by their authors and really shoddy forms of research that went into it. But it was the dominant norm of the academy for that period in time. Now it's looked at as a major error and a major error with some very uh, horrific consequences that were associated with it. Uh, so I don't want to uh, denigrate that in any and saying that, uh, hey, this is the same thing. But I, I do think at least a couple decades to maybe even centuries from now, people will look back at this era and find out that a lot of the history that was being written was driven by ideological presentism rather than actual scholarly analysis. We're close to time, but how did you get into this? How did you become the... Uh intellectual watchdog? Well, uh, I have always had a habit of very closely reading footnotes, checking sources, and done so out of curiosity. Um, and this goes back to some of my earliest academic work uh, when I was an undergrad, when I was writing my undergrad thesis, which was on uh, slavery at the outbreak of the American Civil War. Uh, I had read all these secondary sources and, and books about it, uh, but I got curious enough to start checking things in the congressional record and then going to the archives. And if you do that enough, you'll, you'll start to find things that are misquoted or misplaced or a date is wrong. And uh, if you have a discerning eye, you, you just pick up on these types of things. So that uh, kind of uh, investigative uh, approach to studying the past has always been uh, with me. And then when I began encountering works like McLean and some of the others that I've criticized, uh, you know, I use the same methodology, but then find that uh, it is clashing with some very egregious and, in fact, in some cases, intentional errors. Uh, so it just becomes kind of a, a, a skill that I've cultivated. And, 
tended to work with. Um, I also view just as a matter of personal integrity uh, that there is a need uh, to be self-scrutinizing, that there is a need to uh, be very rigorous and robust to evidence when making a strong claim. Uh, so on a personal level, it, 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 it seems unethical what a lot of these people are doing when they uh, overstate their claims or intentionally mislead about their evidence. Uh, so I view myself as someone that uh, is speaking up because it needs to be done. I have one last question for you. Sure. What is one thing that you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your <laughs> position on and why? Ooh, wow. Well, those are always the tricky ones. Um, you know, uh, I say going back to the late 1990s, early 2000s, um, when I, I'd always been kind of libertarianish in my outlook, uh, but I came at it from a, a more traditional Republican perspective at, at first bit. And, uh, you know, the the big issue at the time was terrorism and the war on terror had just broken out. 9-11 had just happened. And at least for the first bit of that, um, I, I kind of bought the media line and the political line that, oh, well, we need to go to war to stop the terrorists. And it was over a couple of months of just seeing where that was going. And I think the big turning point was when they started pushing things like the Patriot Act uh, that seemed much more focused on domestic surveillance and expanding the power of the state than actually addressing the problem of terrorism. That caused me to, to be much more scrutinizing of what was going on there. And uh, then I discovered public choice theory, public choice analysis. And a major component of that is uh, an explanatory model for how the state expands in times of emergency, uh, how the, the state power um, tends to aggregate and never really ratchet back. It always ratchets up in one direction, to borrow the, the term of Robert Higgs. Uh, so that was kind of an enlivening uh, and intellectually stimulating discovery there that, uh, that changed a lot of my worldview. Once again, I'd like to thank my guest for their time and insight, and I'd like to thank you for listening to The Great Antidote podcast. The Great Antidote is sound engineered by Rich Goyette. If you have any questions, any guests or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at thegreatantidote at gmail.com. Thank you.